burdens are lifted at Calvary. We still live in this fallen world, we still have burdens today, but the burden of sin, the, the guilt and the penalty are taken care of by Calvary. And uh, we have that hope in heaven. Won't it be wonderful there, being with a Savior and no, no burdens to bear. So that's great. Take your Bibles, if you would, open with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And I actually have a lot of material to, to cover today. So I'm trying to decide, do I, do I uh, talk like twice as fast or... Or, no, no, don't. <laughs> Her fingers are already getting tired, so we, we don't want to go twice as fast. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that, sorry. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 7 is kind of our, our theme verse this morning. Dealing with forgiveness. And I'm trying to answer three questions today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to condense the first two a little bit. Originally, I was going to take it a little longer, but we, we want to get through. Um, I'm going to read here in a moment Ephesians 1, several of the verses, centered in verse 7. But I want to answer three questions. This is our third message of this series on forgiveness. Number one, what is forgiveness? What is, what's a definition? What's a working understanding of it? I assume you know, but I'm going to touch on it. I will condense it. I had more material, but we'll condense it a little bit. Second, are there different kinds of forgiveness? Are there different settings for forgiveness? Implied answer is yes. We'll touch on that a little bit more. The one we really want to get to, and it's covered in the, in the title today, Calvary Covers It All. How, how is forgiveness even possible? Uh, how, how can God, the holy God, uh, overlook sin? How can he forgive it? And so that ties in with the definition of forgiveness and so on. But we want to develop that. I want to read Ephesians chapter 1 and verses, uh, verses 3 through 10. And you understand even that's not the full sentence. This is, this is the longest sentence in the Greek New Testament. Uh, it's actually verses 3 through 14. We're really just interested in... Um, in verse 7, but I'll give you the context. So let me to read it. Blessed be the God and Father, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. That's in Christ. In him, in the Beloved, that is in Christ, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, which is the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things in earth. And so verse 7, in him, in the beloved, which is Christ, in him we have redemption, that is, which is the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of trespasses. And so we want to, the, the summation of it, the big, the third question, how is this possible? It's made possible. We'll develop this in the time we have this morning. And this is a pretty foundational message for Christians to understand, is that, you know, to put it in a slogan, Calvary covers it all. It, it is all taken care of at the cross. Christ took care of the sin issue. But let me answer those first two other questions quickly. Number one, what is forgiveness anyways? Well, we understand it roughly. We understand it partially. Uh, we understand it intuitively and practically. But let me make a couple suggestions. Uh, one is, there are actually two different words, Greek words, that are translated forgive. One is, um, and this is the part I'm going to condense. I had more examples and so on we won't cover today. But one is mostly a legal or accounting term. Uh, incidentally, that's the one we've been covering in most of our texts so far. But it's a legal or accounting term. And the essence of it is to dismiss the charges, to cancel the debt, uh, to release, uh, to let go, to send away, those kind of things. In fact, on occasion, it's actually, this word 
is used in a particular setting of divorce. To release or send away, to let go, is to, to annul, to, 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 to uh, uh, take apart the marriage is to send away the spouse. Uh, but in, in terms of, of uh, accounting, that's the, several of the parables uh, use it in this way and it teaches us the thing is that sin incurs a debt. When we sin against God, we develop, we create an obligation. We create a debt before the Holy God and uh, last week's message dealt with that, that it's an unpayable debt. It's a debt beyond our ability to pay. It's too large. We can't do it. Take, it, it. It's more than we can handle. It's an unpayable debt. And in the forgiveness transaction, in the forgiveness process, in the, in the forgiveness experience, God cancels the debt, dismisses the charge. Uh, he releases us from it. Um, there, there's, even in, there's even a hint in this uh, of being freed or released from the debt. Uh, we, we haven't even touched on this yet. We won't in this series probably. But let me throw it out there. There is the, the underlying principle that not, not only are we uh, freed from the debt, where the debt is canceled, the sin debt is canceled before God, but you understand uh, this is kind of Romans 6, 7, and 8 material uh, that we have, we are in having a sin debt to God, we are slaves to sin. We have it, that debt relationship makes us slaves to sin. This is Romans 6, 7, and 8. And in the forgiveness transaction, there is the uh, provision that not only is the eternal debt forgiven, the, the, the obligation of the debt payment, but the power of sin is destroyed. And so there's a freedom that is now available through forgiveness as well. In other words, victory in living. We haven't even touched on that. That's not our main point today either. Anyways, there's the first word, legal word, accounting word, dismissal, dismiss the charge, cancel the debt. And so in terms, in very simple terms with sin, we are sinners before God. And when God forgives, he cancels that sin obligation. The debt is, is marked as paid in full. It is taken care of and wiped off the books. And, we, and that's why the, the uh, parables, the stories that use money, uh, the indebtedness of money, we all get that. We've all been in debt or we've borrowed money from a friend or loaned money to a friend. And we understand when it's paid off, the debt's finished. And so that becomes the, the very, a very uh, well-rounded picture of, of, um, of God who forgives the debt of sin. Second word, and we haven't come across it yet in our studies too much, is a, actually a grace word. It's in the family of the grace words. And so it's really an application. It is a particular extension of grace in our lives that we're to extend to others. We'll get there, by the way, a couple messages down the road. We will, we're going to take the fact that we have been forgiven by God. Uh, it becomes a command. In fact, we glanced at it last week. It now becomes an obligation on our part, a command. Since we're forgiven by God, we're to forgive one another. And typically, usually that's one of these grace words, we're to extend grace and forgiveness fully and freely like God has done for us. And so that's, that's what forgiveness. So the, the, those are a couple basic words. The definition, a working definition might be this. Forgiveness is a promise. Uh, forgiveness is a pledge. Uh, in other words, a decisive, uh, known act. It, it, it's declared. It's a decisive act, a promise to not remember the offense or the sin any longer. That is, don't bring it up again. When God says, I forgive you, he has made a promise, a divine pledge, that he will not bring that offense up against us again. He will not remember it. Uh, some of the Wednesday night people will remember that we discussed this. It's different than forgetting. God, being omniscient, doesn't forget. But he says, your sins I will remember no more. As far as the east is from the west, uh, that's how far away. Into the depths of the sea I have cast them. And so God pledges in this. He promises divinely in the forgiveness transaction uh, to not bring them up against. The debt is canceled, never to be rescinded. And so that is, is what we're talking about. A, a, a transaction, a decisive pledge or promise. That is different than a feeling. 
it's not just I feel forgiven or I, you know, I feel like forgiving you. It is a, it is a decisive action. And so that's what we have. A, a forgiveness is a promise. Secondly, quickly, are there different kinds or types of forgiveness? Again, for sake of our time this morning, I'm going to condense it. There's at least two, at least two. Different writers uh, use uh, different theologians, different commentators use different language. Uh, allow me to use uh, the, the one uh, would be permanent forgiveness or judicial forgiveness. When we come to Christ, when, when the blood of Calvary covers our sin and we put faith in Jesus Christ, there is a permanent forgiveness of all sins. It, it is a, a, the action of God in the work of Christ applied to your heart or to mine. There is a permanence. This is an everlasting, eternal forgiveness. God will not rescind it. God will not stand back. But God, as the judge of all the earth, in that act, at, because of Calvary, says, I have forgiven this sinner. That is a permanent act covering all sins judicially. There, the, there's no longer a, a judicial or legal jeopardy. Because what is the legal jeopardy for sin? The wages of sin is death. The, 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 the penalty, the payment for sin is death. So in the salvation process, the justification act, uh, the forgiveness that occurs at the new birth, God as the judge says, no more. I have canceled all that debt of this sinner. I see him in Christ and he is forgiven by the blood of Calvary. And so that is a permanent one. That's a judicial one. The second, and, there, and we can divide it a little further, but for ease today, the second aspect is a forgiven person. So I have placed faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a born-again believer. Uh, you know, I did, uh, my mother led me to the Lord many years ago. I think it's coming up on 50 years now. <laughs> uh, but but uh, praise God for that. I, I'm a forgiven sinner. The issue is, the good news is those things legally before God the judge, those things judicially, those things permanently, my sins have been taken care of at Calvary. I no longer have to give account for that because they're in Christ, covered by the blood. But just like you, even a saved sinner, I still sin. I still have faults and flaws and sins and failings day by day. And there is an aspect, there is a, at least this second application of forgiveness that is uh, not permanent. It is continuous. It's daily. So this is 1 John 1, 9. And this is what kind of, if, so some of you weren't here for the, some of the messages. This verse, 1 John 1, 9, is what started this whole series discussion here the last few weeks. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, who's the we? We believers, we who are saved, who are the children of God, if we believers who have been forgiven permanently, eternally, judicially by God, if we confess our sins, well that implies we do sin, and we know that's true, but if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so that is a text, that is, that is a, a verse that's not dealing with judicial, one-time, permanent, uh, once for all kind of forgiveness that happens at Calvary, that happens at salvation, it is an ongoing process that we need daily. We, in fact, if you're like me, you probably need it more than daily. You know, it hap we sin, we fail, we stumble. Uh, we need God's cleansing and forgiveness on an ongoing basis. And so there's at least these two, judicial, courtroom, God the judge, permanent forgiveness of the penalty of sin and then the second one the ongoing regular feature uh, of uh, God uh, forgiving us in Christ on a daily or more than daily basis what's it dealing with that's fellowship so we, the courtroom uh, and fellowship in the fellowship forgiveness because even as a saved person even as a believer in Christ when I have sin in my heart you know, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the scripture says the Lord will not hear me. It interrupts my fellowship, it hinders my prayers, it disrupts my fellowship and a daily walk with God. And so we need that taken care of. And so there's at least these two. We'll leave it at that for now and develop it more later. Judicial, permanent, 
uh, forgiveness and ongoing regular daily fellowship forgiveness. Our big point today, out of, out of Ephesians 1, I'm going to cover several texts here rather briefly, is a major point. How is all this possible? So we understand forgiveness is God dismissing the charges. We understand that he does it once for all at salvation, when we're born again, when we come into that new spiritual birth uh, relationship with God, sins are forgiven. That's Ephesians 1.7. In, in him, uh, in Christ, uh, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's what happens there. That's one of the things that happens. But we also have this ongoing need. How is any of it possible? God is a holy God. He cannot just write it off the books. He cannot just sweep it under the carpet. He cannot just let it go. Why? Because he is a holy God and his law is a holy law and it demands justice. The justice of God must be satisfied. Uh, I don't want to get too political here, but apparently it sure looks like as I read articles... Uh, that uh, some of our justice system in the United States has not kept up with that standard. You know, equality before the law and, and um, the, you know, the, you remember Lady Justice is typically, uh, the statue of Lady Justice is typically portrayed as being blind, right? Blindfolded because we're all equal under the law. The law applies equally. And what I'm saying here is God has a law. He hit the law, the Old Testament law, the law of nature and so on, is a reflection of his complete holy nature. And he cannot say, well, so-and-so sinned, this person over here sinned, uh, I don't feel like dealing with it today, I don't, it, we're just going to let it go. That is not possible. Sin demands an answer. It, it is part of the, so how, so my question here, this is what we want to develop is, how is forgiveness possible? I think you already know the answer. It is, it, it, it's sloganed in the title today, Calvary Covers It All. So let's look at that. And the, the baseline, the simple principle is Christ's death takes care of the sin need. That's, that is the basis for forgiveness. Let me take you to a couple passages fairly quickly. Um, go with me over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And, and you're, Doris, you're sure I shouldn't read too fast? <laughs> okay, all right, Hebrews chapter 9. That'll help, that'll help. Hebrews chapter 9. There, uh, again, I wish we had a little closer to like five hours to work on this today, but we don't. All right. Hebrews, interesting book, fascinating book. Uh, chapters 9 and 10 uh, deal with the superiority of Christ as sacrifice over the old, uh, old covenant, the bulls and goats, over the Aaronic priesthood and so on. And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to read uh, verses 11 to 28. Um, and I'll read fairly quickly. So this file, I'm reading ESV, this file in your Bible. What you're looking for is this, it's a long explanation. Hebrews is a little bit uh, wordy, a little bit windy. But what he's, he's covering the topic of Christ, the high priest, who is the sacrifice uh, in comparison, in, in superior comparison to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, in which the priests had to offer for themselves first, because they're sinners, and then they offered, and then they offered again, and again, and again, year after year, day after day, and so on. Christ did it, look for the wording, once for all. Allow me to read 11 to 28, and, and uh, read it quickly, so you can kind of pick up the flow here. Hebrews 9, 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Uh, he, Christ, entered once for all, once for all, into the holy place, place says, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. This is Calvary covers it all. Thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled purses, persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will he purify our conscience from dead works 
to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded you. And in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let me stop there. It goes on and says, um, uh, the, it goes in, all the way into chapter 10, the saying similar things. And I developed the argument, Christ is superior. He offered himself, the, the Old Testament priest had to offer a sacrifice for themselves first because they're sinners. Christ did not. He is sinless. He entered into the holy place and offered himself once for all, one time only. I'm going to take it to another passage over in Romans. Romans chapter 3. And it's the same principle. Here it's Paul writing. I don't, I don't think Paul wrote Hebrews, but here Paul is writing. We know that uh, this is a Pauline epistle. And in chapters 1, 2, and first part of 3, he has developed the fact that all are sinners. We are none, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks God. This is like chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, we're, we've all gone out of the way. We're all sinners. And he has a, a long uh, a litany, a chain, a chain of references from the Old Testament that cites uh, Old Testament uh, verses saying that fact. We're all sinners. Every single one of us is a sinner. And he, can, he begins his final conclusion of that in verse 19. So I'm picking up in, in Romans 3.19. And again, I'm going to read a, a, a section here, a little bit longer than normal for a sermon. Um, and you listen for the connections to, to Jesus and Calvary, Jesus and his death. The conclusion he comes to about all people is in verse 19. It says this, 319. Uh, now, uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be ha held accountable to God. For by works of the law... No human being, no flesh, will be justified in God's sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Conclusion, everyone is a sinner and the law cannot save. That's a, a whole discussion for another time, but we are all sinners who cannot save ourselves. Verse 21, the good news. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, without having to keep the law. Although the law and the prophets speak of it, they bear witness to it. Verse 22, the righteousness, this righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This is going to beginning to sound familiar to gospel message because it is. <laughs> we are saved, we're justified by faith alone in Christ alone. The right, verse 22, the righteousness, the justification of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, how? By his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. He had held off judgment. It was to show, verse 26, his righteousness at the present time so that he might, this is a very interesting phrase, verse 26, so that he, God, might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let me pause there for a second. Interesting verse. God held off on full judgment of the sins done before uh, the, this new righteousness, this righteousness in Christ was revealed. Why? Well, he has forbearance, he has mercy, he has patience. But he wants to be both just and he wants to be the justifier. What does it mean by he wants to be just? 
Well, that's that whole thing we're discussing today. Forgiveness is not God just saying, oh, I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to sweep it under the rug. Uh, you know, let bygones be bygones. All kinds of phrases we use, right? That if he's going to be just, his holy nature and his righteous law says sin must be accounted for. It has to be dealt with. It, it is a breaking of my law. And so he must be just. But he also, the verse says, wants to be the one who justifies. He wants to be the justifier. How does he do that? This whole section is developing it. It is a righteousness of God found in Christ when Christ died for us. And he becomes the propitiation. He provides the redemption. That is, he pays the price. Jesus' work on Calvary, his shed blood, is that covering. And again, it's that slogan we're using here, Calvary covers it all. The basis of forgiveness is not because God is gracious, though he is. It's not because he's merciful, he certainly is that. And, and nor that he's loving and patient, he is all of those. It is because in his justice, moved by his love and grace, he provided a, an alternate payment, Jesus the Righteous One. And it is Jesus' blood shed at Calvary that covers it all. That is the basis of, of, the, of the righteousness and of the forgiveness that happens. Let me continue reading there, verse 27. I'm sorry, let, let me jump ahead to verse 1 of chapter 4. There is a development there, but let me jump ahead to verse 1 of chapter 4. What shall we say then was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? This is a very key verse, by the way. A citation of Genesis 15, 6. The scripture says this. Abraham believed God, and it was counted, or credited, or put to his account. It was counted to him as righteousness. This is how Abraham was justified. He believed God's promise. He believed God. Verse number four. Now to the one who has works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And then it's going to cite David. And we read this for scripture a week or two ago. David in Psalm 32 said, Blessed, this is verse seven. This is a righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And whose sins are covered, blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count as sin. There's more to this, but this is a very central one to understand the logic, to understand the legal issues. By legal, I mean the God law stuff. The reason God can forgive sin at all is not because he just lets it go and says forget about it. The reason, the basis for forgiveness is because Jesus died in our place. It is his shed blood. It is his cross work. It is Calvary that covers it all. And as we develop this series over the next few weeks, Lord willing, if he should tarry, it is not only this permanent judicial forgiveness. Calvary covers that. We're saved because of redemption. We're saved because... Uh, if you're here today and you've trusted Christ, we're saved because Jesus paid it all at Calvary. And it covers the sins. They are paid for. And God sees us in Christ. But it not only does that, it now becomes the basis when God says, I've forgiven you, now you forgive your brother. I have freely forgiven you, now you forgive your sister. He is not asking you to do something he has not done. And he's not asking you just to forget about it. He is saying, Calvary already covered it. Now you apply that in your life with your family. And so that's, that's the main thought we're trying to get here. This judicial forgiveness based on the cross work of Christ once for all. It's connected with, with uh, justification. That's in Romans 3 and 4. It's connected with redemption. Uh, it's connected with the blood of Jesus. That's what we mean by Calvary covers it all. Uh, connected to our initial salvation, our new birth in Christ. And it is the, the basis, it's the foundation, it is the legal reasoning for why God can forgive sin is because Calvary covers all. Christ died in our place. And so we want to, to think along those things. Ephesians 1, 7, 
in him, in Christ, we have redemption. We've been bought with a price. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. And so we praise God for that. We're going to turn our attention to the Lord's table um, because that is a celebration of that very thing. It is a remembrance of Calvary and Christ dying in our place. And so let us turn our attention in that direction for just a couple minutes here. We'll, we'll keep it rather simple. Um, but uh, as we gather our thoughts and gather our hearts around the table, we, we recognize that the basis, the reason we're here is because of Christ, because of Calvary, and what Christ did for us once for all on the cross. And we gather to remember it, we gather to celebrate it, uh, we gather to examine our own lives and see that we are walking in a fashion worthy of that, uh, pleasing in all things to the Lord. So let's take our hymn books, if we, if we could. We'll sing just a verse of, I think it was Jesus Paid It All. Either one. Okay, yep. 276. 276. You, you can play. You can play out of that, yep. 276. Jesus paid it all. Just one verse. Having pondered in the sermon, and again, I feel, I feel inadequate as I often do preaching the Word of God, but we've, we've at least looked at and touched upon these truths. These are very foundational. This is Christianity 101. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's linked with our salvation, our justification, the forgiveness that comes from that is based on Jesus and what he has done. His death his, on Calvary, his, his work there covers it all. As we come to the table, and we actually read that out of Matthew, that section where the Lord's table or communion is instituted, we're reminded of the two elements. And again, in our little special packets, uh, remember there is a, there's a wafer in the top that is supposed to be bread, you, you'll think of it as bread, uh, that reminds us of the body of Christ. He came in the flesh. He came in a body, the God-man, and died. His body hung on a tree and bore our sins. And so that reminds us of that. The, the full sacrifice of Christ dying on the cross of Calvary. And the, the bread symbolizes that. Uh, that element symbolizes his, his body. It reminds us of that sacrifice of what he accomplished once for all. This, the second element, we'll get to in a moment, of course, is the cup. Uh, e even more tightly associated with forgiveness. It is his blood that redeemed us. That is the actual price that was paid. The blood of Jesus shed for us. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so we want to take just a moment here to reflect on that. It is a memorial, and at the same time it is a celebration. It's a strange thing, isn't it? There's a, there's a somberness to reflect on the Son of God dying for you and for me. And the reason he died is because we're sinners. We, we violated the law of God. We deserve the punishment that he took. And so that, that memorial part, that remembering part is very somber. It is a serious thing. But in the midst of it, there is a celebration, isn't it? We are forgiven people. We have a Savior. We have one who loves us and died for us. And we have one who is coming again. In fact, Paul mentions that we proclaim his death 
until he comes. And so there's a, there's a celebration aspect. I'm going to ask, I think it was Brother Phil, wasn't it, to pray for the, uh, the bread, the wafer, uh, symbolizing the body of Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. Amen. Paul records the words there in 1 Corinthians 11 regarding this, what Jesus spoke. And he said, of this, of this bread, of this uh, symbol of his body, take eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The second element is the cup, and uh, I always think it, it uh, almost more easily represents, I guess because of the color and the fluid, but it symbolizes the shed blood. And we recognize from scripture that that is the actual ransom, that's the payment, the shed blood of his death covers it all, Calvary, but the specific payment is the shed blood of Christ. And so this cup reminds us of that. The forgiveness that we have because of Christ paying the price for us. And ask Brother Mark if he'd give a prayer of thanks, a praise to God for the gift of his son and for the shed blood of Jesus on our behalf. Amen. Paul continues there in 1 Corinthians 11, instructions that he had received from the Lord. And the Lord had said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, this do is off as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Do you folks know, blessed be the tie? We know that one. We can sing it a cappella. If we had a starting note, do you have, I don't, I can't remember where it starts. I'll give it a whirl. All right, bless me. Why don't we stand together? I'm, we're going to pray and then, or we're going to sing that. And I see Dan. I'll have you close in prayer in just a second. And when we're done, all right. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. I'm going to ask Brother Dan to close our time in prayer. Uh, if you would pray, a reminder of the deacon's offering, and that's out, uh, the plate is out in the back. We usually do it in conjunction with the uh, Lord's table. And if you'd even pray for that offering as well, for their special needs that might be met. But dismiss our service with a word of prayer, if you would. Father God, we thank you for the glory of your grace. Thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. And the love that sent him on that journey to shed blood. The love that calls us to forgiveness. Calls us